welcome to our audience here in the Creative Centre. So a very warm welcome from York St John University. I'd also like to welcome about 200 colleagues uh, who are with us virtually this evening. And those colleagues are from all over the world. And uh, let's hope they're experiencing rather better weather than we are. A great British tradition, to, of course, to talk about the weather. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, this evening's uh, speaker, Professor David Sheard. So David is Professor of Emotional Intelligence in Care in the School of Science, Technology and Health at York St. John University. So a little bit about David, after gaining his degree and social work qualification from the University of Hull, Professor Sheard worked for 14 years as a social worker in hospital and community settings. He specialized in dementia care, becoming the general manager of old age psychiatry in an NHS trust. He later left the NHS to set up Dementia Care Matters and was the founder and chief executive officer for 23 years up to 2000. Uh, sorry, 2017. An internationally respected author, filmmaker, and motivational speaker, David Sheard has won multiple international awards for his work on establishing a revolutionary model of dementia care. His person-centered ethos has challenged accepted modes of care and has brought about positive change around the world. David is best known for his butterfly model, which focused on running care homes for the benefit of the people with dementia, giving them the best possible opportunities to achieve a good quality of life. David has spoken vividly about filling care homes with the stuff of life, teacups, boas, soft blankets, dolls, a piano, family photographs, all chosen to reflect the lives and interests of the people living in the care home. Moira Welsh, in her new book, Happily Ever Older, Revolutionary Approaches to Long-Term Care, notes that David Sheard makes people cry. So be warned this evening. She described David in a Toronto conference room telling 500 long-term care leaders that their system was killing old people. Moira said of David, he has the face of a cherub and the delivery of a man who doesn't give a damn about who is offended. David has spoken frequently about dementia care drowning in management that drives a culture of restriction and control that drives out the individual with dementia. Ouch, that was really, really uncomfortable for the sector back in the 1990s, and not everyone agreed with David. Later, David was described by a well-known TV documentary maker as the Marmite man of dementia care. Personally, I love Marmite. <laughs> David has also spoken about the importance of leadership. He said, inspirational leadership can come from the smallest word or deed, but is always rooted in a depth of feeling. Leadership requires passion, vision, beliefs, and an ability to turn those into actions. I think that really sums up David's leadership qualities. Since 2017, David has turned his attention to the wider problems of our health and social care sector and its workforce. Just before the pandemic, David gave a keynote talk to the 10th Annual Registered Nurse Symposium in New York. He spoke about removing the neutral mask, being more human in a new culture of healthcare. David has gone on to champion emotional intelligence in care. We are privileged this evening to hear Professor Sheard's inaugural professorial lecture entitled Valuing Nous, Injecting Health and Social Care with a Booster of Emotional Intelligence. So over to you, David. Thank you.
All right, I'm just trying to click through, but it's not doing it on either at the minute. On the on the clicker or on the There we go. Thank you. Well, I don't know if I'll make you cry, but I'm certainly not here to offend. Uh, first of all, a huge warm thank you to a number of people. To Professor Karen Bryan, the Vice Chancellor, for having the faith in me and inviting me to take up this role at York St John University. Also a welcome to Dane Julie Unwin, the Chair of the Governors here at the University. Uh, in particular, I want to warmly welcome all my new colleagues in the various schools here, and particularly the integrative nurses and students who I've recently been uh, in a workshop with. Thank you for coming. To the 200 people around the world, many of you I know, I know. I spoke today to people in Belgium, the USA, Canada, and Australia, and thank you for joining. I also want to thank uh, a friend here, Deb, who's known me since I was 26. Uh, and actually has known me probably longer than anybody here in the room, 37 years. Uh, if you knew me, you'd know that's a very scary thing to have known me for that long. There are people I want to dedicate this Professor Inaugural Lecture to. To my parents, uh, who both died in the last two years, for supporting me to be the first in my family to come to university. And also to Peter, my partner who's here, who through 31 years has seen me through thick and thin, as you will read in the About Me page on your chairs. So why did I choose the word nous? Well, I was brought up in Bradford by a true Yorkshire lass. She had lived in a back-to-back -back house in Halifax and would never have ever dreamt of me standing here. And our family still retains our great love of fish and chips as our mother and father ran the fish and chip shop in Halifax. My mother was a great believer in Nouse, in Yorkshire Nouse. And for those of you around the world who are live streaming, I'm gonna give you only one minute of a language lesson in Yorkshire. So let's go to the Yorkshire. In Yorkshire, where I was born, and I've now returned after 43 years away, they say, now then, here's a guide to chatting right Yorkshire. In other words, forget the Queen's English, Yorkshire people believe Yorkshire is the basis for the entire English language. We're right, you're not, and don't let anyone tell the otherwise. So what I'd like you to do is with the person next to you is translate these three sentences. You have just a minute to try and translate them. And so, the first sentence, I may be from Yorkshire, but I didn't actually know what it actually was saying. It's saying, put the box in the loft. And I didn't know that word was uh, about the loft. The second one, I did know, uh, the lake in Dant Wreck, you've been playing in the park. And the third one, technogome of your brother, ignore your brother. But of course, Yorkshire may think it has the nous and added an e on, but nous without the e began in ancient Greece, meaning intellect, common sense, and Homer used nous to single signify what people really have on their mind. That, the, that nous was that real thing we have on our mind as opposed to what we say aloud. And as Karen said, perhaps I've been known for saying what's on my mind aloud. But if I studied and looked at this lecture about classical philosophy, 
And there are a whole range of definitions that Nous is the seat of the faculty of reason, that it's the faculty of the human mind necessary for understanding what's true or real, the sixth sense. Aristotle saw Nous as a power, a faculty, part or aspect of the human soul coming from outside into the body. And then other Greek philosophers saw Nous as a higher mind. And in Islamic philosophy, Al-Farabi placed Nous atop of the hierarchy of being. And as you came in, you came into a track by Lucy Schwartz called The Feeling of Being. And another philosopher said, much learning does not teach much Nous. I hope being here at the university with other colleagues, we'll prove that wrong, that much learning can teach Nous. In the Orthodox Church, there are further meanings. The Orthodox Church saw Nous as a noetic energy that functions in the heart of everyone spiritually and who's healthy, that it was the joining of intellect, spirit and soul, the focusing of attention between mind and heart, and that phrase, the mind's eye. And it was interesting in all my 40 years of working with people with dementia, I used to say they may not have facts and logic and reason, but they have the mind's eye. So where are we at with emotional intelligence? It became very fashionable in the 60s. And then in the 90s, Daniel Goleman published his seminal text, which is still seen as such today, where he defined these five aspects of emotional intelligence. My definition is perhaps a bit more disruptive. I see emotional intelligence as a grave societal issue about the nature of humanity. And surely during the pandemic, have we not got to the point where we really, really need to look at emotional intelligence, not only in care, but in society. That emotional intelligence is about challenging the political and policy oppression of a minority. In other words, emotional intelligence is everything that otherism isn't. What do I mean by otherism? The exclusion of a person based on their perceived diversions from an acceptable norm. Other, otherism was in Nazism, in the Cold War, in our politics of women and in, immigrants, in child labour, and in some, but not all aspects of care. If emotional intelligence was really alive and well in health and social care, otherism wouldn't exist. And of course, for 25 years, I've wrote and lectured and spoken about the prevention of modern warehousing of older people. And we have seen examples of that around the world through the pandemic, where the pandemic exposed the warehousing. And we've also seen that in the health and social care sector in the last two years, people who have given everything, absolutely everything, heart and soul, to other people and are then faced at the end of it, and we're not at the end, but have been faced at this point with the impossible choice of burnout or numb out. The transformation of person-centered care into a life philosophy has to happen. It is not something to teach people how to do in hospitals and care homes. Emotional intelligence in care is about believing this is something that's felt. The examples of emotional intelligence. Moria Welsh, who wrote this book that's just come out, Happily Ever Older, quoted Andy Isaacson in America. And she quoted the amazing spirit when 60 of the staff moved permanently into the care home without their own families. And he it's quoted in the book, we did it because we just felt it was the right thing to do, which is usually your best decision. I think our relationship-based model of care was the foundation. That's why we got 60 volunteers. I'm not here in any way to criticize health and social care. I'm here to honor the thousands who've lived and breathed this type of giving. And to comment, 
strongly about the dangers of a sector ward out. So do we need emotional intelligence? My argument is, if you actually even think that's the question, then we've got a huge problem. We shouldn't even be debating whether we need emotional intelligence, because I believe we all know. We know when we walk in a hospital ward or a care home or a day support club, whether it feels right in our gut or not. And yet we don't all speak up, even though we're part of the whole health and social care sector. We know when we meet boards and managers who are not feeling it. And somehow you sit in the room wondering at what point and at what cost should you speak out? In Canada, I have many, many friends and many, many managers of care services whom I admire. But the pandemic revealed what we'd always known were long known truths. And the journalists, when the military was sent in by the government, reported this. The military report on long-term care homes reveals long known truths. And these are truths known worldwide. They were not just Canadian truths. Cockroach and bug infestations Seniors calling out repeatedly for help. Rotting food. COVID-19 infected patients put in the same room with those who were healthy. Missed meals. Seniors left in soil, diapers and linens. These were just some of the things the Canadian Armed Forces personnel have seen while they were helping in five long-term care homes in Canada. And I would suggest those could be in many other places in the world. Neuroscience backs up nous and common sense. Neuroscience has shown that we have a great plasticity in our brains, which is molded by experience. That actually we can change our brains to be more emotionally intelligent. In the UK, We've had the chronic tragedy of a child death and the announcement of a national inquiry. And most of us must have sat and listened and thought, where was the nous? And yet I would never be holier than thou. 30 years ago, I too ended up in a national child abuse inquiry when I made the fatal error of not seeing that the parents would intervene in not letting their little girl aged eight die of diabetes. Now in emotional intelligence is complex, it's not simple. What do I think of as emotional intelligence? On your chair I gave you a sheet about me. It was not about being offered a role here as a professor at this university, which has welcomed me with open arms and been a fantastic community to join. It's felt like coming home being here. But the sheet on the chair is part of the real David Sheard. Words that you might think someone would not openly share on a professorial inaugural lecture. I would urge you to go home and try this as a personal exercise yourself. Would you write like I did, depression? flawed? Would you write some of the other words, your words? How really person-centred are we with each other at work? And so as I begin to build a body of work here at York St John University, I've commenced it with what I describe as a charter for emotional intelligence in care. And this is over two pages of the slide, and people will be able to pick it up on the recording of this lecture, and also it's available on my linked website. So I won't go through it now, but it gives the basic bones of what a Charter for Emotional Intelligence and Care would look, sound, and feel like. And then I started to look to other people, 
and to where they were with me around this subject of emotional intelligence in the workplace. Dame Julie Unwin, the chair of the governors here wrote, it's not that long ago that workplaces were viewed as temples of rationality, places unlike the chaos of family life, where cool heads can make rational decisions and operate with order. The workplace has always been a highly emotional place. Hilary Cotton at the Health Foundation has been writing strongly and critically. She describes the pandemic as a cataclysm, brutally exposing the crisis in the funding, culture and operation of our care systems. What we're missing is the new framework that would allow new models to grow and in turn allow us to thrive. And she went on. The choice faced by thousands of health workers, social workers and care workers is between burnout and numb out. And this is my quote. There's almost a deliberate suppression of emotions at work in healthcare. It's as if we have a fear of unleashing emotional tidal waves. When in fact, I believe valuing and supporting emotional labor does the opposite. It frees staff up to be themselves at work. And just as in emotional intelligence studies have shown, it increases levels of staff being, reduces staff sickness, and increases staff retention. If that's the case, then we need to go back to a congruent theoretical model of emotional intelligence in care. And I worked my way through these pieces of study from Heidegger in 1927 to Hilary Cotton this year. And we need to be able to find a way to bring all these pieces of work together. In 1927, Martin Heidegger wrote, being is not a state of what, but a state of who. John Paul Sartre wrote, being requires a person to accept authentic impulses to not allow the will of another person to change your action and to not accept conventionality. I'm not sure I would take credit for having all these things in emotional intelligence, but I've certainly not lived a life of conventionality. Professor Tom Kitwood, the ultimate guru of person-centered care at the University of Bradford in 1997 wrote, Contact should take us out of our customary patterns of over busyness, hypercognitism, and extreme talkativity into a way of being in which emotions and feelings are given a much higher place. Wilbur in 2004, don't you already feel the simple feeling of being? Don't you already possess the immediate gateway to your ultimate spirit, which is nothing better than the simple feeling of being. I come to this professorial inaugural lecture having experienced a period of depression in the last two years. A depression which was tough, turned me into a raging person to live with. A depression which resulted in me getting up one morning and saying to my partner of 30 years, I can't do this life. I can't be nothing, wiped out, empty. And so I began the journey on a simple feeling of being by saying to Pete, I need a dog. I need a dog. And if you go on my website, which launched last night, you'll see Bodhi, my Tibetan terrier. And I said, then, and I need purpose. I have to have purpose. But it's not easy, is it, as a professional with a long career to say, this is who I am. This has been the simple feeling of being. And yet the ultimate guru of vulnerability, Brenny Brown in the States said, vulnerability is not weakness and the uncertainty, risk 
and emotional exposure we face every day are not optional. Our only choice is a question of engagement. Our willingness to own and engage with our own vulnerability determines the depth of our courage and the clarity of our purpose. The level to which we protect ourselves from being vulnerable is a measure of our fear and disconnection. And when I said I wanted a dog and purpose, my third thing was, I need some help. And that was hard to face. And to find then the most fantastic counsellor here in York, John Bell, who slowly helped me put the pieces back together. And of course, Atul Gawande's famous book, Being Mortal. Being mortal is about the struggle to cope with the constraints of our biology, with the limits set by our genes and cells and flesh and bones. We've been wrong about what our job is in medicine. We think our job is to ensure health and survival. But really, it's larger than that. It's to ensure well-being. And well-being is about the reasons one wishes to be alive. The role of health professionals and nursing homes ought to be aiding people in their search for well-being. And I met one of those life coincidences a few weeks ago. I'm walking Bodie on Scarcroft Green and I met Dr. Una McCluskey. And she reminded me that I met her a few years ago on a train. and We'd always said we'd talk. And she said, goodness, you live two, literally two houses away from me, just around the corner. And she published a book in 2019, To Be Met as a Person at Work. I'm a person at work. In my being is a combination of all the factors that make me, me. We are the best diagnosticians of our own experiences and encounters. If we can be offered ways to understand how we form biologically, emotionally, rationally, and how all these systems interconnect, we might bring this intelligence, this information and data into use with how we are working. And if we are managing our professional emotions and well-being. In the States, they have a university which has a huge focus on emotional intelligence, the Regis College in Greater Boston, USA. And I hope to be the beginnings of a foundation of that here at York St. John. And so last night I launched my website, which is a personal website linked here to the university, with the strap line, speaking truth, feeling genuine, being authentic. And then I realized, oh, I hope people aren't thinking I'm claiming that. I'm still learning it. But if you go on the website and click on those words, you will be able to read a sheet where I talk about what is the real meaning behind these three things in health and social care. Emotional intelligence in care is about emotional literacy, emotional navigation, leading with clarity, nurturing emotions at work, creating cultures and people that thrive. To do that, it means you have to call out the truth. You have to call out authenticity and inauthenticity. You have to call out values and emotions in care. York St. John University has a long history of social justice. And I see emotional intelligence in care as a true social justice issue. And here I have a diagram, which I won't go through, of the sort of strategy that I will be working on here with other partners in care. But actually, emotional intelligence in care in the big C is about rays of coloured emotion, but it's more complicated. It's about policy, strategy, architectural design and nursing practice. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be working alongside Dr. Ros Brownlow, who is leading on the first adult and mental health nursing courses here at this university, which commenced in September. And Ros's commitment is to full integrative nursing. 
And she sent me this quote, which sums up the synergy between us, but also her strong passion. Grounded in human caring science, integrative nursing at York St. John University focuses on people as bio, psycho, social, spiritual beings and the use of caring actions to facilitate healing and recovery. The development of emotional intelligence is a key step for integrative nurses, enabling them to listen deeply, connect meaningfully, and meet the needs of another with sensitivity and kindness. And I will give an unashamed advert that if you want to be one of those nurses, come to York St. John. Emotions at work really matter to bring out the best in everyone. Recently, I was in a care home in Cornwall and we spent the day talking about vulnerability and they kindly supplied the photos that are here in this presentation and website. And we had a day about what it felt like over the last two years and that how vulnerability became so close, it was only a flicker away. And what have that done to a manager, an owner, a care team, a nursing team? And on the website, you'll see the manager owner puts a quote where she says, it was all about showing the stuff I was real and vulnerable. And then it all came back again, being real. Making people's diversity counts in the heart of an emotionally intelligent organization. It's about actually not just wanting to learn about difference, but truly embracing that difference. Go home tonight, try the exercise I've put on your chair. Think of the headings of the six words you'd write about yourself and then ask, would your partner, your family, your children, your colleagues, your peers, your team, would they really, really know the sheet of six words about you? That's the beginning of an emotionally intelligent organization. Nurturing kindness is the foundation of developing people. As a result of this po post, I was contacted by the University of Sussex to say that there is a huge movement about kindness and a professor of kindness at that university. And I was hugely encouraged to think there are other partners, other people out there want to join us at York St. John on this. But calling out emotions at work is not easy. It's not easy for a nurse on a shift. It's not easy for a care worker in a large care home. It requires courage. And courage requires support. This was a quote someone sent me when they heard of my appointment at this university. A manager, she said, I'm currently focused on managers' understanding of emotional intelligence in care homes and its application, particularly around staff burnout, which is running higher than industry norms. I believe over the last 18 months, people switched off their emotional intelligence as a coping mechanism. And I want to reignite it and enhance it to help their teams' lived experiences. So this is the outrage bit from me. Where is the emotional intelligence in clapping for heroes in care, which I did as well on the street in East Mount Road where I live, but then radically underpaying them post the peak of the pandemic, and then watching an exodus of staff burnt out, yet mandated to vaccinate without linking this exodus to a lack of person-centered and emotional intelligence towards our whole culture of care. How are staff to truly believe that the health and social care sector that expects them to be person-centered to others was truly going to be person-centered towards them? And I don't want to get into the controversy of mandating to vaccinate, but why was the mandate needed when emotionally intelligent organizations would have worked 
in a more soulful way with staff to work this through. I thought about how to end, and I will, I will end with another couple of slides. But I thought this clip, in its own peculiar way, summed up what I've been saying in this inaugural lecture. And so the true Yorkshire test is not the Yorkshire dialect. The true Yorkshire test, Yorkshire test is that emotional intelligence is the opposite of shallow. It requires depth to believe this too shall pass. Depth to discover your vulnerability, to share it, to nurture it, and to blossom again. And as the film said, and I can't fight this feeling anymore. I did for a time forgot what I'd started fighting for. I did in the end find the strength to let it show. And my plea to everyone in emotional intelligence and care is, don't be afraid to let it show. It's time to stop fighting feelings in health and social care. Let's place feelings and emotional labour centre stage in strategy, policy and practice. It may be a grand ambition, but it was a grand ambition when I arrived home saying I'd resigned from the NHS in 1995, leaving my lease car in the car park. And Peter said, what? Chloe's 12 with a mortgage and you've no plan? And my reply was, I can't be this. I can't have my name on warehouses. And so I went on one journey over 23 years. And this is a new journey. And so rather grandly and perhaps too grandiose, but I do ask you and everyone who's live streaming around the world to join me in a new social revolution of emotional intelligence and care. And my final message is, Mum, thanks for giving me nows. Thank you. Gosh, thank you very much for that, David. Um, really uh, inspiring talk in which you skillfully interweave professional, personal, personal experiences and your scholarly activity. And you break down the boundaries between all three of those. So thank you so much for that. Please give another round of applause to today. So we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, we've got some questions from our remote audience, so we'll try and tackle some of those if that's okay. And then we also have the facility to take a few questions from, from the audience. Um, once we've wrapped up here in the auditorium, there will be drinks um, through, uh, through this door in the atrium, and uh, hopefully uh, David will be around for those to answer any yeah. further questions. Yeah, that's fantastic. Good. All right, good. So, David, if that's OK, we'll start with a question from your remote audience. Okay. Yeah, if that's OK. All right. So um, we've got a question here from Matt. Um, and Matt says it's expected that good leaders have good emotional intelligence. In your experience, David, what other characteristics define good leaders? So uh, Matt is he said ambitiously in brackets, taking for granted that good leaders have good emotional intelligence. So in addition to that, what would you say in your experience a good leader also has? I, I think the core for me is perhaps what I've tried to model in this lecture, that it's joining up the personal professional. It's ditching how I was trained. I was trained to be the detached professional, to leave your emotions at the door in order to be somewhere else that was considered the professional role. And what I think that has done is create phenomenal harm, phenomenal burnout and numb out. And that what we need to create in leaders is permission to be whole at work. How can we advocate person-centered care, which is on um, hospital wards or care, is about wholeness of people, 
when actually we're not modeling it ourselves or we're frightened of it ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take a question from the live audience here, but just a comment from our remote um, audience um, from Samantha, who says that's perfect. Thank you, David, as always. And yes, you made me cry. Yeah, that's from our remote audience. So I'm hoping that in the auditorium, which I can fully. Uh, uh, slightly see um, that Hannah is there with the mic for any questions. So, if you'd like to ask a question, please do raise your hand. And um, from Hannah from our events team here. Thank you very much, David. That was fabulous and lovely to have you here at York St. John. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the role of the arts, do you think, in, in emotional intelligence? Because it strikes me it's such a powerful way for people to express emotion. Oh, that's a whole of a lecture, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I think the arts have become... Uh, an open door, haven't they, for many, many people to be themselves, uh, to find sense in their past lives and the strands of it, and to learn to explore who they want to be without judgment. Uh, and so, yeah, I would hope that leaders in the health and social care sector also see that that might be a way, one way of many that are needed, to re-empower teams and to start to slow down this exodus. Thank you, thank you, David. Hi, um, hi, David. Welcome. Um, just, just a question about care, because we we talked a lot about the nursing homes and, and care homes and so on. I think it's also worth thinking about the domiciliary care sector, sure. um, which I think is a sector where the human in human to human care has been very much taken away, where often care is stripped down to what can you do in 15 minutes? Mm. And it just becomes this kind of underpaid role where you have this burden of, of trying to look after someone and people are starved of that emotional contact and, and what people really need in human to human contact. So I just wonder what your thoughts are, because it seems to me that it, it's just, often we neglect that, that sector. Yeah. We think about care homes, yeah. we think about nursing, but I think we need to think about the people at the coalface, often in the community as well. Really, yeah, really good point. I, at, one, at one point in my life, I managed uh, home care services in uh, Leicestershire. I despair at those sort of time restrictions of 50 minute pop-ins uh, it might seem a facile answer, but it's actually a real one. You know, it was about 10 to 4, and I said to Pete, oh, I better get showered and dressed. You know, we have to be out the door at 10 past 5. And his reply was, well, we'll be lucky then. You know, in other words, you know, I'm 63, and I take a lot longer to get ready than I did at 33. So it's just, it's part of the otherism. It's the detachment to think that we can go into a body in 15 minutes rather than a person. And I know there are lots of innovative home care services that are refusing the contracts on that basis. And that takes me back to the word about courage again. It takes courage to refuse to be part of otherism and to turn down work and contracts. But that is real emotional intelligence and care. When people say, we will not accept these contracts. Uh, while some do, then we are highly conflicted about what the purpose of health and social care is. Thank you very much. I'm just going to check our remote audience for questions or comments there. Um, Hannah's saying, thank you so much, David. I'm with you wholeheartedly. Uh, together we can move things forward to ensure care becomes truly centred in emotional care. So a huge amount of support there from your remote, Thanks, remote Hannah. audience. Um, thank you for that uh, comment, Hannah. And over to Hannah in the auditorium. Um, if anyone in our live audience uh, has any questions, then you're welcome to raise your hand. Pick up the mic. Thank you. It's been a really, really interesting lecture. Um, 
I'd, I'd just be really interested to hear your views about how how you can develop the approach around emotional intelligence and link it into some of the work around uh, self-directed support and some of the movements around people taking charge of their own care plans and their own arrangements for care and, and, and is there a link do you think in the way that that can be delivered yeah that's a fascinating complex question isn't it yeah because there was great hope when that came in the idea that people would uh take finally control and be given the money and the means to be in control of their own lives and it somehow got lost I think it got lost because we presumed that people would have the skills to know how to find the right care, how to assess it, whether it was appropriate for them, uh, how to make choices between providers. And as we know that, you know, brokering care is highly complex. And yet we didn't equip people with the means in a human way to go about. And, it, you know, even if you know, if I needed that care, you know, someone with heart disease and a quadruple heart bypass, it's still a minefield and I've been in it 40 years. So I think if we were going to get people more empowered in control of their own lives and their own purchasing of care and their own decision making around it, we, we need to go back to the beginning. We need to go back to the strategy and the policy makers about what are we really offering people as the choice? Uh, you know, what if, you know, I, I wanted to choose to get help to help me to walk my dog because the dog means everything to me. Would that be actually commissioned, contracted? Would, it, would I be given the funds? So it's complex. Uh, and I think it's about, I suppose that's it's similar to my career in dementia care. I, I think I wasted too many years. I thought in dementia care, if I write and I go on TV and I have series and films, and if I do all of this and I train and I consult the people on the ground, then it'll happen. Of course, everybody will want it. And of course, what happened is people did cry and people did want it, and people were highly enthusiastic without power. And so I, 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 it took me nearly 10 years in dementia care to realize it's all back to front and you're back to front, David. And I hope on a macro level, in, on emotion intelligence and care, that we don't repeat the same. But whilst I really, really, at this university, want to inspire, and along with people like Ros Brownlow, to, to help people to go out to be emotion intelligent nurses, OTs, physios, et cetera, as an individual, because the micro matters as well. It matters one-to-one -one relationship. But I would be worried if the movement continue to do that for another 10 years and what didn't tackle the whole macro basis on which health and social care is commissioned, purchased, contracted. Thank you. And I'll just check. Um, we've got a comment um, from, from Kate, um, our remote audience, who's saying she's so excited to be here. That's uh, really, uh, great, really great. Thank you. So I think if that's okay, we'll finish with one question from, from me. It's a selfish question. I, I hope that's okay. And then um, we'll, we'll finish and enjoy our drinks. And thank you in advance to, for staying with us uh, to ask uh, questions, answer questions more informally. But my, my question to you is, um, you shared with us your, your caring, um, your compassionate, your rather controversial at times um, life. Um, and I wondered what strategies you've used to continue to find the, the courage, the mental courage, emotional, spiritual courage, just to keep going. Please share your strategies with us. We could I think I'm probably the worst, actually, at, at it. Uh, but I, I think it, it comes, doesn't it, from insiders and what is the ultimate human belief and force and when you're eight years old and you have a policeman at the door come to tell your mum she's a widow with you and a baby brother you know what matters most in life very young you know all we have is now live hard pack it in like fury and so I've lived at a chronic pace and my cardiologist is appalled and said 
four years ago, this must stop. This is a recipe for disaster. The recipe for disaster was when I stopped my purpose, my belief, my mission. And I think having refound that, I feel already I'm thriving. And so I think the message to everyone is, find the thing inside that you know deep down is what helps you to thrive. And it might not be work, and it might be walking on the beach at Filey or whatever, but find the thing that makes you feel it matters today. I'm alive and I'm thriving. And yes, I'm at danger. People have said, I'm in danger of being an over emotional well that sends out the flood waves. I don't find that actually. I find it's more that people are like relieved. They come towards you. They say, we're all like this really, but why does nobody speak about it? So find people who get you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, David those words of wisdom and for your courage um, in opening up to us tonight um, in, in a way that will inspire us to carry on, give us a renewed sense of purpose here as a community um, of scholars uh, here at York St John University. We're really honoured to have heard from David tonight and we're grateful that he's going to stay around and have a drink with us and continue the conversation. David's mentioned his website and the recording of this um, lecture today will be available um, and Hannah and our wonderful events team will be in contact with you to let you know if you'd like to watch again how you can do that and we hope very much um, both to our live audience here in this beautiful auditorium and to the many people watching online that we'll be able to welcome you back soon so thank you very much David wonderful talk thank you, thank you.